Well, good morning, Emmanuel Faith. So good to be with you. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, happy Palm Sunday to you. That means we are one week away from our celebration of the resurrection. And I cannot wait. I'm so excited to celebrate with you. And, you know, study after study shows that people who come either um, on Easter or other holidays and come to church for the very first time come because somebody invites them. Um, not because of the great content that we put out on um, social media, but it's actually because of you. And um, so you could be that someone for someone. And I want to encourage you to take one of those postcards or a few of them that are on the back uh, table on your way out and prayerfully consider who you might invite to come with you next week. The year was 1543 when Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus published his work entitled on the revolutions of heavenly spheres. By a show of hands, who's read it? That's what I thought, all right. It wasn't exactly a bestseller, but it did make a pretty big impact. My guess is even if you haven't read it, you have heard about its influence because this was the book that proposed that the earth rotates daily on its own axis and revolves yearly around the sun. Before 1543, the predominant thought was that the earth was the fixed point in our universe and that the sun and everything else revolved around the earth. Now, Copernicus's idea was condemned as heretical by the church. And see, in Joshua chapter 10, it says that the sun stood still. For the sun to stand still, the sun has to be moving, right? Good. Therefore, the sun is moving, the earth stands still, and that's the way the world works, right? Wrong. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wrong. Well, it was a number of years later that scientists by the, a scientist by the name of Galileo Galilei began to dig deeper into this proposal. And with the development of the telescope, he became more and more convinced that the earth actually was not at the center of the universe, that the sun was at the center of the solar system and that the earth actually rotated around the sun. But in 1615, a, Dom a Dominican friar condemned Galileo of heresy. He was tried and Galileo said to the church, all right, fine, I will back off. But this conviction became like a pebble in Galileo's shoe. He couldn't let it go. So over the next almost two decades, he continued to research and he be became more and more convinced that the sun was in fact at the center, that the earth did rotate around the sun and that we've had it wrong for all of those years. So he came out of hiding and put a stake in the ground and said, no, I believe that I was right and that the sun is in fact at the center. And the church once again said, you are a heretic. The Bible teaches otherwise and you are now on trial. To quote the Indigo Girls, Galileo's head was on a block and his crime was looking up the truth. And under the pressure that he faced, he eventually recanted and said, okay, fine, I was wrong. But he was imprisoned until he died, sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life. It was over a century later that the church finally came around and said, you know, I think he was probably right. And that view that the earth does in fact rotate around the sun was no longer seen as heretical. Now, I think that is fascinating. And I can tell by your faces that maybe you don't agree. Um, I think it's fascinating for a few reasons. Number one, I think it shows just how resistant we can be to change even when the truth stares us right in the face. And number two, I think it shows us just how powerful the narratives we believe are in the way that we actually live our life. Because if you've grown up believing something or you just believe it because it's sort of in the air, it can be so hard to rethink some of your convictions. And so while, while Copernicus and Galileo are on trial, I think more than that, their ideas are on trial. The, the convictions that they have are on trial. And I started to think about that. I think it would do us good to put our ideas on trial. I think it would do us good to doubt our doubts. Like maybe we should scrutinize and analyze the narratives that we believe and build our lives upon. 
rather than just accepting them. Maybe the truth we assume should have to give an account for the ways that it shapes our life. And ultimately, the question should be, has this conviction led to death or life? That's what the passage we're studying is all about. So if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to John chapter 18? John chapter 18. Last week, Pastor Stavon did a great job leading us through the first portion of this trial. Remember, um, Jesus is betrayed by Judas. He's denied by Peter. Then he's passed off from um, Annas and Caiaphas, who are the religious leaders of the day. And he's given to Pilate. And Pilate's told, well, you have to deal with him. You try him. Pilate tries to pawn Jesus off. And here's what he said in verse 31 and this of 18, and this will set the context for our time together today. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Like Pilate's like, this, this isn't my category, you guys. Like you're talking about religion. Like this is, this is you, you deal with it. And the Jews or the Jewish leaders said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to what? To death. Their cards are on the table. This is where they want to see this go. They don't have the power to do it. Therefore, they need Pilate to make a declaration. And from there, what we're going to read today is a private conversation between Jesus and Pilate. We move from the hustle and bustle of the courtyard to the the privacy and intimacy of Pilate's inner praetorium. And in this conversation, even though though it's a trial, it is a conversation, we're going to see an invitation to seismic shifts in what it means to be human. Because it's not just Jesus who's on trial. You're going to see it's Pilate who's on trial. And it's not just Pilate. It's you and it's me. And it's some of our deepest held convictions about the way that the world works And the invitation today is going to be, are you willing to rethink some of the ways that you just assume the way the world works and step into the way of Jesus, which is to say the way of truth? See, Jesus is on trial before the authorities, but we're going to see that the perpetrator becomes the prosecutor, the accused becomes the accuser, and the one questioned becomes the interrogator. By the end of the trial, you're going to see we're all on trial. We are all on trial. And the question we have to answer is, will we receive Jesus's verdict? Let's jump in. Let's jump in. Verse 33. This trial continues and it says this. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the, what? King of the Jews. And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Now, you can see right away, Jesus is like, says to Pilate, like, you're not the only one who's going to be asking questions here. I'll be asking questions too. Thank you very much. And you wonder if Pilate is sort of on his heels a bit, not used to that kind of forthright talk from somebody who he has the power to crucify and kill. So Pilate is really on trial. But maybe bigger than that, maybe you're on trial. Maybe, maybe I'm on trial. Maybe some of the things that we hold deepest in our hearts are on trial. And by the end of this, I I think you and I are both going to have to decide if we accept Jesus's verdict about how to live abundantly. Or maybe better said, Jesus's verdict about what it means to be human. Jesus's verdict about how to live in alignment with the way that God designed the world to work. See, I think this trial is a call to re-examine some of our deepest held convictions and to reorder our lives around following Jesus. The verdict is in. Our old way of living simply isn't working. So let's dive into the details. Let's dive into the details. Because Jesus starts to extend a question, uh, an, an invitation. The first question Pilate asks is, are you really the king of the Jews? Is that what's going on here? And it's a fair question. I mean, remember, after Jesus fed the 5,000 on the hillside, the crowd tried to make him king. Um, 
Shortly thereafter, Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. People took off their coats and laid them on the ground. They waved palm branches. The kids did even. And they sang, Hosanna. God saves. It was a clear declaration. You are our new king. Now, it turned out they didn't like the kind of king he was going to be. But they anointed him and crowned him as king nonetheless. So Jesus' retort, did you say this of your own accord or are others saying it about me, is fitting. And Pilate responds and he says in verse 35, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? He's like, I really couldn't care less, to be honest with you. I'm not the reason you're standing in front of me. Your nation is the reason you're standing in front of me. Jesus answered him and said this, my what? Kingdom. kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And Pilate said to him, ah, gotcha. So you are a king. I think Pilate feels like he finally nailed Jesus down and he's right. He is a king. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the king of Israel. He's the long-awaited savior of the world. He's right. Now, we've talked about this before, but this idea of a kingdom can be a bit lost on us, especially if you've grown up in the United States in a, in a democratic republic. We can get a little bit thrown off by kingdom language. So this might be a review for you, and if it is, that's okay. It's really important that we understand what is a kingdom? A kingdom is the range of a person's effective will. Or to say it another way, it's the place where what they want done gets done, right? So you and I have many kingdoms. Some of you, really many, okay? Um, so, like, it's true. We have many kingdoms and we sort of love our little kingdom because we get to control what happens in that kingdom. As Jesus is talking to Pilate, the empire of Rome or the kingdom of Rome had a pretty massive kingdom. Everything around the Mediterranean within this dotted line is part of Rome's kingdom. That means what, what Caesar wanted done in those areas got done. So Jesus says, you're right, Pilate, I do have a kingdom. So the question I think we would ask is, what, what does that mean? What is the kingdom of Jesus? What what is the, the kingdom of God? Well, it's the rule and reign of God. It's the places where what God wants done gets done. So how many of you, when you open your news app in the morning and you read through the news, you go, wow, it really looks like what God wants done is getting done. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean... That's a challenge for us because as we're going to say, see, Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. Like it's right now. But there's a kingdom of evil and darkness that's present right alongside of the kingdom of Jesus. And you have to decide which kingdom you're going to live in. So when you live in alignment with Jesus, where what Jesus wants done gets done in your life, when you forgive people, when you love your enemies, when you say yes to Jesus, you are saying that you want to live in his kingdom. And when you reject Jesus, you're saying, I think there's a better king. I think there's a better kingdom. What's really interesting is that when Jesus came, the very first message he ever gave was about the importance of God's kingdom. Listen to what he said. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the what? The gospel. the gospel of God. And saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is what? At hand. At hand. Like you can touch it. It's here right now. So repent and believe the good news. Repent. Believe the gospel. So according to Jesus, the gospel is that the kingdom of God is at hand. Like you can live in it right now, today. And let me put it another way. The great, according to Jesus, the greatest news you could ever hear is that the range of God's effective will 
is present here on earth, and you can live under his rule and reign today. According to Jesus, that's gospel. That's good news. But in this trial, Jesus starts to expand the categories a little bit more. And I'm not sure if you caught what he said. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And so some of you might be going, well, Ryan, how is it possible that the kingdom is both at hand and not of this world? I'm so glad you asked. So let's mention two things that Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that his kingdom isn't present in this world. We know that it is because he said his kingdom was at hand. And then he taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Thank you as it is in heaven, right? So the kingdom is present. It just has competition. But it also doesn't mean that his kingdom isn't powerful. It would be just a few decades later that Luke would record for us in the book of Acts that people all throughout the Mediterranean region were pointing at disciples saying, these guys are turning and gals are turning the world upside down by claiming that there is another king and his name is Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying that his kingdom isn't present here and he's not saying his kingdom isn't powerful here. What is he saying? I think it's better to read this phrase and to translate the Greek word ek instead of of this world, my kingdom is not from this world. So Jesus isn't talking about the space that his kingdom inhabits. He's talking about the source of where his kingdom actually comes from. It's an alien kingdom. It's a top-down kingdom rather than a bottom-up kingdom. That's why Peter would write to the churches and say, you are aliens and strangers in this world. Jesus' kingdom is built different. And you may go, well, how so? Oh, I'm really glad you asked because he told us. He said, if my kingdom were of or from this world, my servants would have been what? Fighting. Fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. So how is Jesus's kingdom different? I think he's saying this. He's saying, look at the way that I'm responding right now to this trial and Pilate, look at the way I'm responding to you. I could call a thousand angels at a second. I could try to mobilize my men to come in here and to fight back, but I'm not doing any of that. I'm not powering up. I'm actually extending love. And this is diametrically opposed to the Roman Empire that Pilate was a part of. See, the Roman Empire had this thing that they called the Pax Romana, and it means the Roman peace. The irony of Pax Romana is that they would kill up to 2,000 people on um, Roman crosses in one day in order to extend the Pax Romana. So the irony of Pax Romana is it's only Pax or peace if you're on the right side of the sword. But isn't that the way that every empire works? Isn't that the way that every ki other kingdom works? No kingdom of this world or from this world lays down its life, puts down its sword, and gives till it hurts. That's Jesus' point. He says, my kingdom is different. He values different things. Instead of fighting, he's surrendering. Instead of powering up, he's laying down his life. Instead of defending his rights, he's dying so that others would live. That's what his kingdom is like. And I think you could summarize his phrase. I'm not fighting by saying that love in the kingdom of Jesus, love triumphs over power. See, the true God's influence is always the subversive power of the cross, and that is otherworldly. I mean, try to find another lowercase g God that lives that out. Zeus doesn't, Baal doesn't, Molech doesn't. No, they flex their muscles and they power up and they pummel anyone who tries to resist them. But Jesus is different. He wins through self-sacrificial, others-centered, beautiful love. And here's the challenge for you and for me. If we are going to embrace his kingdom and him as king, 
we are called to live in the same way. See, for the early followers of Jesus, the fact that they said Jesus was king meant that Jesus had their allegiance, not just doctrinally, but their lives as well. It was going to change the way they lived. So I think the question might be, okay, well, Ryan, like Jesus is on trial, but he's putting the system of the world on trial. And his verdict is that love triumphs over power. Like what might that look like in our everyday lives like today? Well, I was, I was praying over that this week and trying to wrestle with that in my own life. And here's what I sensed God showing me. And my guess is it, it, it may apply to your life as well. I think to apply that love triumphs over power means that we embrace a posture where we surrender instead of trying to control. And just to be quite frank with you, I'm learning this afresh lately. <laughs> I hear a laugh down here because I, th- I think I probably always will be. Right? And maybe you always will be too. I'm learning that if Jesus is king, I don't have to be. I'm being reminded that there's only one throne and I'm not on it. And hey, this just in, neither are you. Neither are you. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced more and more in my life that I don't really realize how much I love control until I lose it. But when I lose control, I freak. And I think that makes me a control freak, right? Yeah, right? Like I I get terrified. Well, if I'm not in charge of this, then who could possibly be trusted to make sure that this turns out okay? Because I'm the one who makes sure everything turns out okay. Right, is anybody with me? And I'm learning that a lack of control, a realization of my lack of control is actually a fresh invitation to trust. That's the beauty. That's the beauty. To trust that God is a good father, to trust that he loves me, to trust that he's enough, to trust that he is, his way is way better than my way and to trust that he is way better at holding the things I love than I am. Let me say that last point again. God is way better at holding the things and the people that you love than you are. He is holy and completely trustworthy. He is trustworthy. I I think this was the essence of Jesus' prayer in the garden. When Jesus is sweating drops of blood and crying out to his father, it says going a little bit further, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup, referring to the cross, pass from me. Like God, if there's a, father, if there's another way to accomplish the salvation of the, of of humanity, let's do it that way. Nevertheless, I think it was Karl Barth who called this the defiant nevertheless this like stake in the ground, worthy of my life, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's surrender, not control. When was the last time you prayed that? Like prayed it with your hands in the air or your knees on the ground and face on the ground. Not my will but yours be done. It requires that we trust God. Catch this. It requires that we trust God more than we trust ourselves. And I think our sometimes inability or our resistance to praying that actually reveals that we don't. Like maybe a good question for you to wrestle with this afternoon is, do you trust God more than you trust yourself? And if the answer is no, Man, you get this beautiful invitation to repent and believe that life in his kingdom is actually better than you reigning over your little kingdom. Like, that's a beautiful invitation. And the truth is, you guys, the truth is that eventually we will all come to the place in life where we face something too big to control. And it may show up in the form of a health crisis or a job loss or a relational blow up. Eventually, you will get to the place where there's something in your life that you can't control based on your own power and your own will alone. 
Ah, but here's the beauty of the invitation that Jesus is giving. That's the place of transformation. That's the place, the letting go, trusting God, surrendering. That's the place where we are transformed more and more into his image. And in that sense, these impassable events become gifts to be received because they drive us to our knees and remind us there's only one throne. And we're not on it. And we never were. And you never will be. And you get to surrender afresh. I think that's what Paul meant when he wrote and said, I will boast all the more gladly in my what? Like when was the last time you did that? Gosh, I'm so weak. Let me tell you all the ways I'm weak. So that the what? The power of Christ may rest on me for when I am weak, then I am strong. Oh, you guys, I think you might have missed it because there is immense freedom in that truth. I don't have to have all the power. I don't have to control everything. I only have to trust the one who holds all things together. And then somehow his subversive power starts to reside in me. I die to myself so that I find out what it means to really truly live. And that is life in the kingdom of God. But it's only experienced when we stop fighting. The very thing that Jesus said described his kingdom. So it might look like forgiving those who wrong us. Stop fighting. It might look like letting go of our anger. Stop fighting. It might look like serving the people around us, even if we don't think they deserve them. I mean, power says you've got to deserve it. Love says, I'll give regardless. I mean, for Jesus, it looked like, Father, forgive them to the very people who are driving the nails into his hands. They don't know what they are doing. So are you living in that kingdom? Have you pledged your allegiance to that king? Now, from there, Jesus starts to expand the categories even more. I mean, what could be bigger than a kingdom? that triumphs over the kingdoms of the earth through sacrificial love? I'm so glad you asked. Keep reading. Here's what's bigger. Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. And for this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world. Okay, so if you've ever wondered, this would be a great study because there's a number of times in the New Testament where it says Jesus came for this reason. Here's one of the reasons Jesus came. To bear witness to the truth. truth. Everyone who, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? So Jesus claims not only to be the king, but to be the possessor of ultimate truth. Why did he come? To reveal truth. To be a witness to truth. Now, Pilate asks this sort of great postmodern question that's debated in universities all across the U.S. and throughout the world. What is truth? It's a great question. What is truth? I think Pilate accidentally asks the right question. He doesn't stay long enough to hear the answer, but he asks the right question. And we'll hear things thrown around in our cultural moment, like your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and don't push your truth on me and I won't push my truth on you. And I think the right question might be, is that the way that truth actually works? Like, can you have a truth that's different than my truth? Like we can have experiences that are different from each other, but, but isn't truth like a bigger category than simply what I experience? Uh, maybe, maybe we should answer that question. What is truth? Good question, Pilate. Here's how I would define truth. Truth is that which corresponds with reality. That's what truth is. It's that which corresponds with reality. Or if you'd like a, a Willardian quip, Dallas Willard said, truth is what you run into when you find out you're wrong. <laughs> Dallas for the win. Dallas for the win. I love that. 
And Jesus, so, so let's just use the term reality in place of truth, because I think it makes the passage pop a little bit more. Jesus says, Jesus says that he came to bear witness to reality. What does he mean by that? I think what Jesus means is that he's giving us a picture of what it means to live as human in the way that God always designed us to live. There is a way that God designed us as human beings to function. You can try to swim against that stream, but you will be swimming against that stream your entire life because you're going against what's woven into the fabric of the universe itself. Like, you can say, I'm unwilling to forgive those who wrong me, but it will eventually kill you. It won't kill them. You can say, I have made friends with my anger, and that's just the way I'm going to live. And your blood pressure and your resting heart rate will continue to rise until it feels like you're suffocating, and you will die. And so Jesus is teaching us a better and different way to be human. He's teaching us a way where truth reigns over deception. And the devil's main tool is to deceive He's the father of lies. And if the devil's main tool is deception, your main weapon is truth. And from the very beginning of his ministry, friends, Jesus has been calling people into the light. That is to say, into the truth. In fact, he claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And here, I think he ups the ante a little bit more, and he says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So he goes, I'm the dividing line between truth and deception, between reality and falsehood. He says, I'm that dividing line, which has massive implications for our lives. Massive implications for our life. So, if you would allow me to just sort of poke around a little bit and, and maybe even open up to the spirit doing some work in your heart and your life, let me just ask a few questions that are in line with this claim that Jesus makes to say that he, when he speaks, he speaks truth. Do you debate Jesus or do you trust Jesus? Like think about Jesus's vision for, for life and abundance and reality. It's better to give than it is to receive, debate or trust. Jesus' vision of human sexuality, debate or trust. Jesus' affirmation that all life is valuable, debate or trust. Jesus' challenge to rid your life of lust, debate or trust. Jesus' call to release anger and bitterness and to walk in forgiveness, debate or trust. Jesus' command, not suggestion, command to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Debate or trust? Now, does that mean we never wrestle with God? Does that mean we never doubt? I certainly hope not, because I know I do. I think it means that when we wrestle with God, we wrestle to be defeated, not to win. We wrestle saying, I know that you are right. I know that you are trustworthy. I believe, but help my unbelief. That's, we wrestle to be taken down by the one who will cause us to walk with a limp for the rest of our life, forever changed by his presence. Do you debate Jesus or do you trust Jesus? Is your posture before God one of pride or one of humility? I think the posture of humility demands that we put Jesus back into some categories that we've largely taken him out of. Primarily, the conviction that Jesus is brilliant and intelligent. I, we, we don't think of Jesus in those terms, to our own detriment. So when he says things, we're like, I don't know. We'll try that on. Um, in his uh, newest book, Practicing the Way, John Mark Comer wrote this. He said, Many Christians don't consider Jesus all that smart. Holy, sure. Kind, yes. Even divine. But intelligent, not really. See, I think if we were to boil it down, a lot of us think that we are smarter than Jesus. 
I think we, we think we have better ideas about what it means to live a life that flourishes than Jesus does. Like when, when you boil it all down, I think that's what's at the heart of so much of our resistance. We think we are smarter. In fact, um, I, I tried this on for size and I, I just Googled um, lists of the smartest people throughout history. And I found two lists of 25 people, one list of 40 people, and Jesus didn't crack any of those lists. He's not even in the top 40. I think he's like, really, can you tell me more about that? (laughs) The one who claimed to know reality has largely been relegated to the space of spirituality or a way to have our sins forgiven, which he operates in both of those spaces. But sometimes to our detriment, that means that we take him out of the place of our day-to-day lives and the decision-making that actually drives a lot of what we experience in this world and we relegate him to spaces that he's way bigger than. I think the most important question, one of the most important questions you can answer is, do you believe that Jesus' words are truth? Do you believe in his vision of what it means to live abundantly? Do you think that you are smarter than him or do you think he's smarter than you? And that's what's on trial. You are on trial. The verdict's in. But we have to decide what we do with that. So love triumphs over power. Truth reigns over deceit. That's what happens in this inner room, this praetorium, where the ways and systems of the world are judged by the creator of it all. But I think for me, the question remains, like, how do you step into that? Like, what does it look like to actually step into his way and his kingdom and his truth? Is it by willpower or, or striving or, or how do we get in? And that's where John um, records the next portion of this story in a brilliant way because it starts to serve as an operating paradigm for the kingdom of God. Let me say it like this. The story being told is bigger than the events that are happening. They're painting a picture on the canvas of history. Listen to what happened next. After he'd said this, he went back outside to, this is Pilate, went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Is Pilate right? Is Jesus innocent? Yeah. But you have a custom that I should release, everybody say release, one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I I sympathize a little bit with the plight of Pilate. I mean, he's caught in between. He's caught in between these Jewish leaders and the crowds. He's caught in between his wife, who's like, he's innocent. You better not kill him. He's caught in between Rome, who's saying, you have to do what the people under you are asking them you to do. He's caught, and he's trying, see, Pilate, Pilate's trying to remain neutral, but what Pilate shows us is there is no such thing as neutral. Like, you are either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. There's no spiritual Switzerland. And I want you to see the picture being painted because it's powerful. Barabbas is sitting in a jail cell, presumably with no clue what's going on out in the courtyard. He knows that he deserves the punishment that's coming to him. He knows that he's guilty. He's a robber. Some people think he's a murderer also. So here's the picture. One man is completely innocent. Pilate got that right. One man is clearly guilty. One man will die, the other will go free. Both men will get what they don't deserve. One will get death, the other life. One will be the recipient of the greatest injustice the world has ever seen. One will experience God-given mercy. So here's the point. You are 
Barabbas. I am Barabbas. This is a picture of the good news of Jesus. You may or may not know it, but your sin imprisons you. And the scriptures say that the wages of sin is death. And you will either pay for the wages of sin or Jesus will pay for the wages of your sin. But there is no third option. The death that we deserve because we've severed the, our relationship with the author of life is what the wages of sin determines for each one of us. But, but, the innocent one was crucified so that the guilty ones may walk free. Jesus would go to the cross and Barabbas would walk away in liberty. Paul would describe in theological terms what was going on like this. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, this is the great exchange. He was imprisoned so that we would walk free. He was forsaken so that we would be accepted. He was condemned so that we would be forgiven. He goes to the cross so that we might walk in liberty. We are all Barabbas now. That's the picture being painted. And how do you enter into this new life, this abundant life, this with God life? You enter into it simply by putting your full faith in the one who took your full punishment. That's how we step into it. Jesus bore our guilt so that we could walk in his freedom. That's the verdict. And the question is, what do you do with that? You've got to decide. Uh, when I said that we are all Barabbas, um, I, it, it, I think it's more true than maybe when it first fell on your ears. Because the name Barabbas means, um, are you ready for this? The name Barabbas means son of the father. And there it is right in the middle of his name. I never saw it before. You might not have either. Abba, Daddy, Father, S Son of the Father. Do you see what's going on? The capital S Son of the capital F Father is going to the cross so that lowercase s sons and daughters might walk in freedom. Friends, this is the good news. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. No, they, they cried out, crucify him. We want Barabbas. What they didn't know is what they were actually saying is, we need to become Barabbases. We need to become children of God. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, see, that's how you step in to this new name. He gave the right to become Barabbas, to become children of the most high God. We're a room full of Barabbases now, sons and daughters of the King. The year was 1758, over a hundred years after Galileo's trial, when the powers at B finally admitted that the sun was in fact at the center of the solar system. And maybe, just maybe, that's the whole point that Jesus was making too. Maybe, just maybe, it's an invitation into his kingdom and into his truth where he's calling us to displace ourselves from the center of our own little universe. And he's calling on us to entrust our lives to the Son of God. And in so doing, to become sons and daughters of God ourselves, This is the new way to be human. But it's also the original invitation to find our life in it. And I pray that we will. Would you close your eyes? Some of you are here today and maybe for the very first time you realize that you're like Barabbas, imprisoned, maybe in guilt and shame, 
in a past that you just can't seem to reconcile and a future that you just can't see. And I want you to know that the perfect one has taken your place, that he's gone to the cross, that he's paid the penalty of sin, that you might walk in the freedom that he deserved. And so maybe you're here today and you say, I, I want to put my faith in him. The scriptures are clear. They say anybody who would receive and believe would become sons and daughters of God. So you might say something in prayer to God like this. God, today I realize that I'm in prison and that the prison door is unlocked because you have already paid the penalty And I trust you as my savior, Jesus. I trust you as my Lord. I surrender my life to you, believing that you are smarter than me. And I want to receive your forgiveness and walk in your freedom. Come, Holy Spirit, live inside of me. Be my guide, be my teacher. My life is yours. And Lord, for for the rest of us that maybe have already made that decision, it's so easy to get caught up in other narratives and other stories about the way that the world works. It's easy to power up instead of loving. It's easy to get caught in deception instead of walking in your light. And so today we would just say back to you, we recognize that at one point we were in that prison cell and that because of your grace and mercy towards us, we get to walk in freedom. And our prayer would be that we would experience that freedom in every way you want us to. We thank you for loving us, Jesus, for being the true son of the father and making us sons and daughters of the father ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.